I, I had this in my drawer and my email went on vacation since the morning. Sure. I mean, things are getting better. Because yeah. we're going to have to open some schools next time. I had piles of blankets on. This is St. Michael. St. Michael. Blessed Hope is. Yeah, it felt warm, right? My problem is I have a gas stove, but it's all digital. There's no oven override. I couldn't light it. I could okay. light the burner, yeah, yeah. so, so I could cook, but I couldn't light the oven to heat it up. Like I swear it was. Now I know. Now I don't know. Why. And I give this when I opened the fridge oh, to see is what the, the food was doing. It was down warmer in the fridge than it was in the. And I know this isn't final. This is just a recommendation <laughs> yes. that you to the CIC. Yes. 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 At least two members of the CIC that look very faithful. Those are small enough, like 78. Yeah, and that's a small enough amount. That should be like. I was worried about another night. Big, no, I came on last night. Came on last night. Thousand to twenty five thousand. If there was a reason. That's an older thing that bothers me. That's my thing too. Is the I dark? Mean, that's really too many people one. come out. That I shouldn't be. You can ask her. She's here. Ron, is she? I haven't seen her. Uh, yeah, she, yeah, yeah, she's in the back. Just, and, uh, Tara will be coming. The one is for the truck to the, the department. Just buy your vehicle for CDBG. <laughs> it depends. It could be. I mean, the life saving equipment. Okay, tonight we're going to have a study session regarding the Lincoln Park Development Authority and Board Commissions. We could all please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we please have a roll call? Certainly. Councilpersons Bear? Here. Dupre? Here. Ross? Here. Salcedo? Here. Soar? Here. Tobin? Here. And Mayor Higgins? Here. Um, since we are here to talk from the uh, DDA, I'll give, to, to bring it right over to Carl and let him uh, start it off. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I think what we ought to do here is get some introductions uh, beyond the council. Uh, you know, we all know you're here. Thank you so much. Um, but I'd like to just kind of go around the room. Let's start in the back row. Please identify who you are and what your affiliation is with uh, development commissions and boards in the city of Lincoln Park. Joe Grove, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you. Tom Grimes, CDBG coordinator. I'm Brazo, and I'm the assessor. Sure. Just sit What? Just a citizen. That's okay. Please identify yourself. I'm Pat Coulter. Pat Coulter, citizen of Lincoln Park. Okay. John Myers, building official. Bob Steele, EDA. Tom Carr, GDC. Larry at GDC. Mike Horvath, Planning Commission, and Planning Commission rep on the Building Board of Appeals. Leslie Wilson. Fred Wilson, CIC. Brandon Fry, DBA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we uh, start these reports, we're going to circulate the sheet. We'd like you to just put your name down, sign it, print it, whatever. And uh, we'd like to keep a record who's here and in attendance. And Brandon, you'll be sure to note that all the council and the mayor are here as well. Yeah, I'm belaboring this because um, this meeting uh, that we've now had several times over the last couple of years was one of the uh, items that uh, the redevelopment ready communities requires uh, if you come up to speed and uh, have a redevelopment program in your community that makes it easier for everybody to understand one another and uh, to be able to project to the community, uh, the development community, citizens alike, that uh, we've got our 
proverbial act together when it comes to redevelopment and other development issues within the city. Um, so this is a best practice, in other words. And uh, I also want to point out that this began uh, back when uh, Mr. Tom Carnes was mayor and he convened the first uh, few of these meetings. And uh, he's here, as he said earlier, as he is the uh, chair of the Economic Development Corporation. Anyway, um, as we go through these uh, topics, uh, if you could wait, We'll have a Q&A session afterward if you want to get into some of the depth of this. Uh, we're not going to uh, give you a long dissertation on any one of these topics, but we want to identify where these projects and these undertakings stand and how they might uh, go forward uh, through proper channels in the community. So enough said about redevelopment-ready communities. That's why we're here. Um, one of the first uh, uh, large studies that we undertook uh, was the Southfield Road Corridor Study and Plan. Uh, if you recall, as we've reported in the past, uh, we were very fortunate to get this $100,000 plus study uh, paid for by the Michigan Treasury, uh, thanks in great measure to James Crizan and his connections with uh, the state treasury. So um, that study is now completed. Uh, I've reported out to both the council and the, ED, uh, the EDC and the DDA that this document is finished. We have posted it on the city website. Um, it's uh, identified as draft for adoption. Uh, it's been up there now for about 30 days or so. Um, the, the best thing that I want to tell you about this is that we didn't do this study for kicks. We wanted it to help guide uh, changes that we're anticipating with respect to the zoning code for the Southfield Road corridor, uh, particularly for that, uh, that kind of uh, depleted area of Southfield Road that's, uh, you might say, east of Fort Street. Um, nonetheless, um, we need to get this, this particular study and plan adopted as an element of the city's master plan. So uh, very shortly after we conclude our meetings, uh, like this evening for instance, we're going to forward that report officially onto the uh, Lincoln Park Planning Commission uh, so that it can take proper actions to have public hearings and to make a recommendation to the city council with respect to the, uh, the study and plan. Um, this study and plan has not been just collecting dust on, on the corner of my desk or anybody else's for that matter. We have uh, submitted uh, applications very recently uh, to the uh, Michigan Department of Transportation and the uh, SEMCOG, uh, Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, uh, to try to secure some money through the Transportation Alternatives Program uh, to make a road diet on that uh, segment of Southfield Road east of Fort Street uh, that runs to Ecorse Creek. Why a road diet? Well, our analysis indicates that we've probably got more traveling uh, capacity than we necessarily need. Uh, if we uh, reduce the laneage for uh, travel, uh, we can recover that right of way and uh, make the corridor uh, much more useful for bicycle traffic and for that matter for pedestrians. Um, more crosswalks and the like. Uh, but that project uh, was authorized for submittal at the last city council meeting and it made it out the door uh, about a week ago. Um, Fort Street Transportation Equity Study. Um, this was a similar uh, undertaking to examine what's going on with the Fort Street corridor, primarily focused on traffic. And uh, the question is, uh, does, it, does that corridor too have some ability to become more multimodal, um, more useful for pedestrians, more useful for bicyclists, and is there anything we can do to enhance uh, tra uh, transit trips on that corridor? 
Um, we discovered uh, through the study that the northern uh, reach of, of uh, Fort Street north of Southfield Road probably does in fact have surplus capacity. Uh, so that also could be a corridor where we would choose to implement a road diet that could enable us to have safe passage for bicyclists, better accommodations for pedestrians, and also transit riders. South of the corridor, south of Southfield Road, shall I say, the Fort Street corridor is very heavily traveled. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's already got about, uh, what, three lanes in each direction. Uh, it carries very heavy traffic volumes. It kind of works with Southfield Road uh, that heads west towards Allen Park. It provides access and connection with the interstates. And it in that section also has pretty heavy traffic. So, you know, we're not seeing any possibility for road diets on Southfield Road uh, west of Fort Street nor on Fort Street south of Southfield Road. Nonetheless, there are several places along both of those corridor legs where there could be a better crosswalks for pedestrians and some other uh, uh, things that can be straightened out to, to make it more appealing for that type of travel. One, one issue in particular is that when you uh, get to the point where you go under the railroad bridge to make uh, your turn to get on, um, I guess it would be southbound 94, um, there's not really a, a good passage or a, a path for uh, people that are walking. And uh, our transportation analysts looked at uh, this particular situation and thinks there can be something done with the travel lanes there. Uh, there's a, a right-hand turn lane there that doesn't necessarily Carl, need to exist. Did you I mean southbound 75 and not 94? Yes. Yeah, I, I apologize. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I stand corrected and don't mind that from time to time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so anyway, um, Yes, we're, you know, we're looking at that. We're uh, um, uh, back in October, I think some of the DDA members recall, on one of our meeting nights, there was a deadline to submit an application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for some planning funds to further uh, develop the concepts for the Fort Street Corridor. We submitted that application, and I think we'll probably hear something about that in the next couple of weeks, or so I'm told. So the uh, Fort Street Transportation Equity Study is also a, a study and plan that we want to forward to the Planning Commission so that it can have some citizen engagement, hopefully formulate a recommendation and send it on to the City Council. Um, at this point, <clears throat> I'm going to turn this over for a few minutes to James Crazan, the City Manager. He's going to speak to the next item, uh, Capital Improvement Plan. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Um, so, a, uh, one of the RRC best practices, and actually an element of becoming an essential RRC community, is having a, uh, a, a proper six-year capital improvement plan. Uh, capital improvement planning in the city has historically been, been fairly uh, elementary. Um, we've done five-year capital improvement plans. We haven't really gone through a very uh, regimented process. Um, it typically has always been uh, departments requesting things and then putting it together in one document. This year we undertook a, uh, a more significant process looking at the next six years instead of five, which is the, the best practice by both RRC and uh, the Government Finance Officers Association. Um, basically looking at everything, everything we do infrastructure, buildings, equipment, vehicles, putting that together in a, in a plan. Um, the, the Planning Enabling Act also indicates that the approval body for this is the Planning Commission. We've never taken a capital improvement plan to the Planning Commission, uh, and our intent is to do that this year. Um, of course, I was hoping to have this done already by now because it is, it is a big part of, of budgeting, but we're able to work through it. 
Um, as always with new processes, you're going to hit bumps along the road. Uh, but I think at this point we are now on track to present it to the Planning Commission in April for uh, final adoption in May, which will line up perfectly with adopting the budget at the first uh, council meeting in June. Um, there's a lot of projects and we've got a lot going on, um, especially with a lot of the ARPA funding that's coming out um, and a lot of the other uh, revolving loan programs that we're doing in the next couple of years all the the road bonds that we're we're going through so it's going to be really exciting to see it all in one clean document um and also it hope the hope is to find a real good way to present it maybe using gis to to show each year here's the sewer programs we're doing here are the water programs the roads so that there's a, a nice fun easy interactive way that residents can see where the money is going um but really that's What's happening with the capital improvement plan? Okay. Um, I'm going to spend a second or two here on the zoning code rewrite, but um, I want to emphasize something. Um, with respect to redevelopment ready communities, there's basically two major things that have to be accomplished so that we can elevate ourselves to the essentials level. There's yet another level that's called certified. We don't need to worry about that right now. But the uh, significance of getting to this recognized essential level is that we get, we're put ourselves in a better position to get more help from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, and for that matter, the state of Michigan, as we pursue different redevelopment projects and the like. So th these are two extremely important items. If we, if we don't do these things, uh, we're never going to get to the uh, essentials level. They have to be done. I want to point out also that the capital improvement program is also necessary not just so that you all know and citizens all know what's up our sleeves with capital improvements, but when we talk with businesses that might want to locate and they look at uh, a road that, that might be in really bad shape, for instance, and they say, yeah, but what about that? If we've got those projects outlined in the capital improvement plan and we're behind that with funding and the will to implement, then we can point to that plan and say, rest assured, the project, that improvement will be done in a timely manner as per the plan. So, you know, this isn't just, again, something uh, that's nice to put together and then lay on a table somewhere. It'll help us better advertise uh, our opportunities for redevelopment here in the community. So, with respect to the zoning code rewrite, Oh, and I, I should also mention this. I forgot to tell you. South, or the uh, Fort Street Transportation Equity Study, um, we, we, that was a $35,000 study. We were able to get approximately a little over 80% of that study paid for by or through SEMCOG and the Michigan Department of Transportation. So our, our cost for that study was fairly minimal. Uh, quite often, transportation funding comes with a matching requirement. The unusual one was the Southfield Road Corridor when Treasury picked up 100%, but it's not unusual to see at least a 20% matching requirement for transportation planning, design, and implementation. Okay, zoning code rewrite. Um, we entered into a contract with uh, community builders. Uh, wait a minute. CIB, community image builders. Uh, they, they're more than just an image building uh, company. They do planning, zoning, and so on. Um, but uh, they're very capable and they are going through, they've audited our current zoning ordinance. This happened uh, late last year in October, November, something of that nature. And uh, they came up with uh, just an incredible amount of uh, indication of things that they saw being sort of antiquated or out of place or insignificant uh, throughout the zoning code. They did a very thorough job. They were not just looking at it and registering their opinions, they were looking at best practices in the zoning ordinance field, and they critiqued our plan in that context. 
So what we've received up to this point, and these just came in at the beginning of the week, I was hoping that we might have received them last week so we could have talked about them in a little more depth, but we have received several chapters to this new zoning code. I think the important thing right now is to reiterate what we want to see this new code do. We want to make it user friendly, uh, not just for council people or city staff or whomever, but we want it to be, uh, you might say, dumbed down so that anybody that comes in the door can pick it up, read it, and understand what it means and what, what, uh, you know, what uses are permitted, uh, what process you might have to go through to get this approval or that approval. And while we're talking about process, we also want to come up with uh, a little different strategy. Right now, it seems like anything that anybody wants to do in the city of Lincoln Park is they have to go to the Planning Commission. Sometimes they have to take a side trip to the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. What we want to do is two things. Number one, we want to make the, the zoning code more current and have more uses as time has evolved. There's more uses that come to mind and so on. You know, our code was uh, last developed in its entirety back in the 90s, and I guarantee you that in the last 20 years there's been uh, an expansion of commercial uses and the like, so we want to get it more current with, with that. Number two, we want to be able to handle approvals much more administratively. You know, we, we don't see that you have to have uh, a public hearing and a review by the Planning Commission just to see that a developer is going to meet conditions that are enunciated in the zoning code. As long as they meet the, you know, as long as they submit proper documentation that they're going to meet those uh, conditions that are quite often enunciated in the zoning code, why can't that just be approved at somebody's desk? So we're trying to make it simpler. Uh, we've had really quite a few complaints where people had to go through a calendar of dates to get on an agenda, then there were advertisements, then occasionally there might be people that can't make the meeting, no quorum, wait another month. So we're just trying to simplify things and putting a little more uh, confidence in stock in administrative approvals. And again, that's not just you know, trying to uh, eliminate anything from the process. It's really just trying to make it simpler for developers uh, to do business here in the city of Lincoln Park. We expect that we will have a complete uh, zoning code rewrite a bit available back to us after we've reviewed it at the staff level and had some more consultation with the consultants around August of this year. And I'm suggesting that maybe our next joint meeting will hover around that specific document so that we can all uh, look at it, understand it, and critique it before it goes through proper channels. James, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Um, so the next item up is food trucks. And as a lot of people in the room probably already know, uh, we are going to have a study session um, next Monday prior to the council meeting to discuss some possible changes, possible tweaks to the food truck ordinance. Uh, we adopted it, I think it was 2021. Um, it's been about two years. We haven't had a, a ton of success in, in creating a market um, for food trucks. And so just looking at a couple different options to try and maybe open that market up and try and encourage um, food trucks to, to operate, not just during our special events, but, but on a more regular basis and trying to figure out ways to, to, to regulate it while loosening it as well. Um, that's pretty much it on the food trucks right now. We'll have a lot more next week yeah. um, at the study session. The next topic that I see here for me is the former Sears site. Um, everybody knows where Sears is, Dixon Southfield. Um, it's midpoint of last year, uh, the Sears, Sears site had been sold. 
uh, by Seritage to a group called the AF Jonah Development Group. Uh, this is a development group out of Birmingham, I believe, West Bloomfield, and they uh, have done a ton of development up in Oakland County. They have done a little bit of development in Wayne County, uh, mostly in like the, the Woodhaven area. Uh, but they have continued to, to reasonably aggressively look at different options for the site. Um, the, the biggest obstacle right now is the building, um, trying to get through to, to line up all the, the proper financing and get everything ready to knock that building down. That building is, is obsolete and is going to have to come down. Um, so they will be, I believe, hopefully real soon, uh, presenting their, their Brownfield plan to the Brownfield Authority uh, to try and move forward with the demo of that building so that they can start the actual development process. This, com this company has done a lot of really good developments. They think they're, they're an asset to have in our community. So hopefully everything is going to work out really well. Um, that's really all I can share right now. They, they like to try and keep things pretty, pretty tight until they actually bring forward uh, development plans to the Planning Commission. And hopefully they're going to have some of that real soon. So. Yeah, just um, a little bit of follow-up to the uh, SEER site. Uh, and I mentioned this all a couple of meetings ago to the EDC. But um, the EDC next meets on March 14th. I don't think we'll have time to review everything and get all the ducks in, in a row for that meeting to take a public hearing and take action. But I think we'll have... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do a dress rehearsal and go through the steps that the EDC and the city council are going to have to take uh, to effectuate and uh, make operable a Brownfield TIF district. Um, so we're getting close here to Q&A, and we'll open the floor up. But I noticed that we do have uh, three department heads here, John Myers, uh, Joan Krieg and Bob Brasso. Um, I just want to ask them if they have anything they want to share with the group this evening. Um, the microphone is yours. This is assessment time, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're okay. Okay. Well, then uh, let's just open it up to uh, questions and answers uh, to the council, to the audience, uh, the board members. Uh, what's on your mind? Yes, sir. What you were talking about, wanting to go forward, your plan and whatnot, but you want to become a certified local government also, if I'm not mistaken, to do that? To do, I, I'm not following you. You were talking, yeah. you were talking your <laughs> redevelopment ready communities? And you're talking about your uh, capital improvement plan uh, for your six year uh, uh, venture. Yeah. You want to become a certified local government in order to step into that particular plan. It, you know, it's it's a it's a requirement technically with the city planning commission. You're supposed to go through that process, and I think as James has indicated earlier that uh, we've treated it like capital improvement plan light. And what I think James is doing, and I'll testify to it because I gave him quite a bit of information on projects that the DDA and the EDC are interested in. But I think you got quite a bit of similar response from department heads. So, you know, again, James wants to have a capital improvement plan that meets the RRC requirements, but more importantly, has is the roadmap for improvements in this community over a five to six year period. But if, we, if we study down that same path you're talking, become a certified local government now. now our, our downtown area could be listed as a historical place, which now adds more funding available to it at the same time. So you might want to look into that. Yeah, I, I hear what plus, you're saying. You need, to, yeah. you need to take the two freeways, 4th Street and Southfield, and tone them down to city roads again if you want to have any foot traffic at all. You ain't going to have foot traffic as yeah. long as there are freeways. Yeah, that, and that's the plan that's expressed in those two documents, uh, particularly the north reach of Fort Street north of Southfield Road and the eastern reach of Southfield Road 
east of uh, Fort Street. Carol, I believe uh, Councilman Tolman had a question. Yes. Um, so you were talking about taking a new business that comes in and instead of having it go through the process of um, maybe requesting a variance or um, submitting the plans to the building department, um, just having it go to someone's desk and having them verify that that's the plans. So while you're doing that, is there any thought of um, redistributing the um, purpose of the, the commissions of planning the building, the dangerous building boards? Are you going to amend that so that reflects that this, this decisions can be made elsewhere? Well, okay, the zoning code uh, is the document and the written policy that the council passes, okay, with you know w working with the planning commission, there there doesn't need to be anything that goes further to these other boards. They have different missions and different purposes. But I will say this: if there is a variance needed, whether it's a, a development standards variance or a land use variance, that would still have to go to the zoning board of appeals. You can't get away from that. You know, you can't have somebody at a desk saying, "Yeah, I think I'll grant a variance." That you know, that just the enabling legislation does not permit that. Okay, that's where my my yeah. worry was. Was that? Yeah, it, you know, right. Yeah. If they if they don't meet the rules as they're laid out in the new zoning code, then one one uh, safety valve could be a variance. Another, you know, there's other ways to uh, deal with those types of issues. Planned unit development is one tool. I'm not going to get into that. And uh, zone change could also be another tool. You know, if the, if the I just want to make sure who's ever going to be making those kind of decisions is well versed and has um, the ability and the knowledge yeah. to know the difference and yeah. to be able to do it correctly. Because I don't want to see this come back down the line and have something be approved that shouldn't have been approved and the person that approved it wasn't in the position to approve it. So I no, think that needs I to be something you're that saying. you look yeah. at. Yeah, okay. and, and I think when we actually have that focus on the code, when we get together, hopefully, you know, uh, six months out, we'll be able to uh, answer those nitty-gritty questions because they're all very good. You know, you can't um, just release a person to do whatever they want. Right. You know that won't work. Well, and if I may, it's it's less about those obscure issues of okay, this project is going to need a variance. This project is going to need a rezone. It's more about the the routine administrative type of approvals, um, change of use that is less um, less intense than what was there before right right not Little, that much of a change exactly where, yeah. where it's not going to bring more traffic and so perhaps well, that would we be a good thing because it's very hard for a lot of businesses and i right. think that we get a lot of deterrent with the way things are now so i'd like that improved i just want to make sure that right it, yeah we're, we're looking at different ways to to streamline routine type of approvals not not the uh the things that actually will be where the request goes against what the zoning ordinance says, right? Like a variance, dimensional use, <coughs> whatever. So, hope that clears some of that up a bit. Thank you, Carl. For, yes. If I may. Yes. Um, what team from uh, from our office, our area? What, who is working with the zoning um, board, the community image builders, to let them know what we want? Okay. Right now, it's at the staff level. Okay. Uh, you know that uh, James is working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, uh, John Myers, uh, our planning consultant, uh, Elizabeth Gundon is working on it. You know we have development team meetings. Uh, you know every couple of weeks, and sometimes topics come up that tie into that. You know with Bob and Joan. So your your development staff, your redevelopment staff, all these pieces and parts. We're working on it, okay? We, you know, um, when we get a document together that we're pleased with, then that's when we want to introduce it to the policy makers, the planning commission, the city council. That, that's, um, that's a best practice methodology to do this. If but, we happen to have something that we'd like to see changed in the zoning, who do we talk to? Uh, 
yeah, any to, any one of us. Touch. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I'll, I'll also mention that the zoning ordinance is, is but a tool, right? And it's a tool that implements the policy <coughs> directive that is the master plan, right? And that's that's really where everything in this is stemming from: is making sure our zoning ordinance works administratively, is easy to use, and reflects the wishes of the master plan. So if there's something specific you have, absolutely send it to, to, to Carl and I. We can ensure that it's being looked at and Great. addressed. Thank you. What is the current turnaround for a person coming to our city who is going to put a business into, into our city? What's the current turnaround before they actually get their business license? At the risk of that being a bit of a loaded question, um, <laughs> right? Well, so it, there are businesses that are able to open extremely quickly um, if they they come in. They're not changing the really changing the use. Um, they're not needing to make modifications to the building. They don't need to go to planning commission, and they work well, you know, with the inspectors, the building department. It can happen extremely quickly. However, it, under. Absolutely under. However, there are businesses that don't come to the building department before they try and open the doors, that don't, um, don't follow a traditional process, that are changing the use, that are doing something that that building might not be zoned for. And those tend to take a while. Uh, those can certainly take a while. But so at the risk of it being a loaded question, it depends. <laughs> It's actually a simple answer. Yeah. Whether or not it's going to take six months or it's going to take, or they can be in in 30 days. Because, you know, most cities, most cities, I'm going to say most because I've been in business in other cities myself, okay? Most of these about 30 days. You're, you're in business. Okay? I can't say that about Lincoln Park. Though. Some businesses can and some businesses can't. They can. It depends on how they run their, how they work. Mike, I believe you were next. Well, on the. Uh, North 4th Street, West Side uh, study. Have you gotten that report yet? Because uh, you had mentioned about the bicycles and stuff, and the one thing on that thing that's always been a problem, in my opinion, on those large planter boxes that take up so much of the site. Okay. Um, Just to bring you the, the, the report does uh, address um, roadside amenities to some extent. And uh, you're spot on with those planter boxes, okay? But, but um, you know, we've been a little bit hesitant to start tearing them down and getting rid of them for a couple of good reasons. Pardon me? You just need to reduce them. Yeah, or something like that. Because in many instances, they're in the way. Um, you know, we, um, they're, they're quite often in the way right now. There's this trend to open up uh, outside dining and uh, quite often those dining scenes are in front and uh, we have so many of those planter boxes that you know it seems like they would always be in the way of something um, but uh, but the, they're also going to be very very expensive to remove if we tried to do it on our own we'd go broke in a year you know they're just too expensive well, and that's where, uh, you know, getting something going with the uh, redevelopment uh, or reconnecting communities program or the RAISE program uh, that uh, Department of, U.S. Department of Transportation has uh, could help. Any further questions? Seeing no further questions, I will end the study session. Thank you for coming tonight. And this is just out of sight. Now, what about that water tower next to food? <laughs> yeah, it, the water it, tower is a different issue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Grandfather, you can't be moved. Well, yes and no. <laughs> no uh, yeah. There's there are some, there are some. Uh, Advertising rights on it that th that they're working through. For so many years it's supposed to stay there. Mm -hmm. On top of it, it's also grandfather due to, due to the being <coughs> some type of historical 
What's that? Is it used to store water? No, I don't. I don't think it's been used in quite some time. Has it been used in years? Yeah. Hang out to dry. Hang out to dry. Yeah. Uh. <laughs>